Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to the Working Hours Podcast, the show that asks leads, what do you do? I'm your host, Simon. This is episode eight, a back in lockdown episode in which I talk to John about projects, technology and the sharing economy. This is a recent recording and I wanted to get this episode out early because of an initiative he discusses in the episode. So I'll be back at the end to say more on that. But just before we jump straight into this episode, I wanted to mention how you can be a guest on the show. So if you're based in Leeds or you're from Leeds and you'd like to be my guest on the podcast, then you can email your name and a brief bio to workinghourspod at westernstudios.com. Okay, I'll be back at the end. Let's get into episode eight. What did you want to be when you grew up? So... (laughs) I mean, thinking back to when I was really young, I, I do remember at one point wanting to be a fireman. Uh, that was like the first thing I remember wanting to be when I grew up. Um, and a, a good friend of mine was was similar as well, up to kind of early teens. And we both used to kind of do fitness stuff together, you know, with the idea that, yeah, you know, if we get really fit and everything, then then we'll yeah. be firemen when we're older. Um, that, that kind of fizzled out. And then the, I think the thing that stood out the most for me was I got into music um so uh-huh. I've kind of my my dad was always musical and from that he kind of passed his guitar to me and then yeah and then picked it up from there and did yeah played different, various different instruments as a kid and so I think once I got to kind of 15 or 16 and we had the school band going and, and we had um a little bit of momentum at that point I thought yeah you know what I think I want to be a rock star <laughs> yeah <laughs> So did you stay in bands for quite a while then? How long were you in? Are you still in a band? Uh, no, no. I, I mean, I, I dabble with little bits at home and, and every now and again I'll meet up with friends for a bit of a jam. Obviously not in the past yeah. uh, 12 months or so. But um, but yeah, so probably from being 16 through to early 20s, I was uh, in various different bands uh, yeah. playing around Leeds. And yeah, that was that was really good fun. Had some really good times. Um, and then you know friends all went off to uni and started doing different things so it kind of you know lives then took over and um, yeah. that kind of yeah fizzled out so it's it's more now just a bit of a uh, passion and, and little dabble at home so now and again I'll pick up the guitar again or get back on the drums for a little bit yeah I mean it's good to have it's a you know it's something to it's another form of expression isn't it something that you have to fall back on and just kind of right I'm going to do this for couple of hours or whatever um yeah so and it's, of, it's much easier when as well when you get to a point of you know what I'm, I'm just going to do this now because I enjoy it you know you kind of just just pick up the guitar and just just play for enjoyment and lose lose a good few hours doing not a lot but it's uh, yeah very enjoyable yeah yeah because you don't have that responsibility of like well I'm doing this because I'm you know you're I'm I'm, I'm sort of honing my craft and I'm working towards my stardom and I'm you know, it's just like I'm doing this because I enjoy it. That's it's it, not and work. It, it's pleasure. Yeah, and and it's a pro- being a musician, like a you know, a proper musician is a real graft. It's you know, I, I mean, I remember our um, bassist at the time. She had a little Ford Fiesta, and we'd all kind of clambered. There were four of us, all in the, in this three door Ford Fiesta with all of our gear in there, and it was just kind of you know going between music venues and. Uh, it was yeah it's tough so yeah there's guys out there that are absolutely slogging it for for not a lot as well you know they they it takes a long time to get any significant momentum so uh yeah it is a, a real graft yeah 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 um yeah i i did actually i've spoken to uh one of my friends who's an actress and uh another friend who's done a lot of stuff in bands uh, it's, it's quite interesting to kind of obviously you know them and you kind of hear day to day but when you kind of like sit down and go into the nitty-gritty of what they're doing it's kind of like yeah that's a slog because <laughs> you, you know most of the time it's like it, it's one of anyone I suppose that's self-employed you know it, most of your work is looking for work unless you get to you know until you get to that point where you're you're just getting so much work that you're then pushing away work or trying to manage the work that you've got yeah then yeah yeah be, that's uh, it. So it becomes then less about the, the doing the music and more about the you know becoming like a, a well I don't know what you described them in in 
to, I guess, a manager, like a manager or, or something yeah, like that, rather than a, a nice musician. You know, you're a professional person, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're a team of 10 people. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so work-wise, uh, what, was, what was the first job you had? So, probably a paper round. You know, from from like twelve years old, yeah, and stacking shelves in in my local shop. I remember doing that. Um, but no, first first proper job I had uh, when I left school, I worked for uh, Sky in a in their call center. They had a call center in Leeds, so um, yeah, I worked there for a little while, just kind of customer service. Um, with, so that that was my first kind of proper proper job out of college so yeah I went to music college after finishing school and then it was uh, into full-time work while I took a gap year to figure out what I wanted to do after after college and that that gap year then I, I kind of got used to having a full-time wage and, and never really that gap year is still going on now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I've heard uh, someone else has said that in terms of you know taking time off and then they were working on that time off. And then it's like, I forgot what I was doing. I just, start, you know, I started working and I had money and I could do stuff. So, mm. I, yeah, I can imagine that's Because if you're doing a gap year where you go away somewhere, then you, you don't fall into that because you're away somewhere. You're either really enjoying it going, I want to spend the rest of my life traveling, or you're like, I can't wait to get home. Yeah, so if exactly. you're working, you're kind of like, well, I'm going to be working all the time and it's nice having money. What was I doing again? Oh, I'm saving for a day. <laughs> But that's it. And I think that that kind of took over that, you know, do I want to go back to, you know, my it was the it used to get I don't know if you still get it now. But when I was at college, you get 30 pounds a week um, education maintenance allowance. It was EMA. And that and so I'd get that on a Friday and then I'd go out on the Friday night and that'd be gone within hours. Um, but yeah, and I kind of thought when I was working, do I want to go back to kind of having that 30 quid to, to see me through? I don't, I don't think so. No. <laughs> so um so i take it you didn't stay in the world of call centers so what what are you doing now what do you work as these days yeah so it, it was a bit of a, a strange path from sky to what i do now for for the day job so now i'm a program manager so i work for uh, within pay tv so the company i work for we design and manufacture set top boxes for uh, like tv operators so you're kind of you know the people like sky and virgin media but all around the the world we we uh design and manufacture their their set up boxes so it's yeah that's a big i mean i guess it's still in the world of of sky in a way it's weird how it kind of came back around but yeah uh, in between there it, there were various different jobs that i had and um yeah, it's it's that thing where you kind of start off doing something and you think, oh, I'm quite enjoying this, and then something else comes along and you think, actually, I quite like the sound of that, and you know, moved on. Uh, I I kind of went from Sky on to working for a building society, so working within a branch, uh, and then progressed to the head office there. Kind of, uh, yeah, did that for a couple of years moved into human resources then weirdly um that kind of but on the more technical side not the people side yeah. um and then yeah i started kind of in, and that happened completely by accident it was just because at the time we'd uh, we just had a little one i was looking to reduce my hours so i could have a little bit more time at home and and this job came up that was technical but part-time and there weren't many technical part-time jobs around it was all yeah. all the part-time jobs at that time were like administrative and things like yeah. that you know I was really interested in the techie stuff so um yeah it just kind of happened not a lot of people applied for that job I think because it the balance just fell right for me um so yeah I worked on the technical side of HR there for a while mm -hmm. and then moved to the uh to pace it was so probably the first set-top boxes we saw kicking around in the UK years ago, um, mm -hmm. doing HR there. And then by chance found myself um, uh, offered the opportunity to move into project management and uh, yeah, kind of grabbed it with both hands because I knew it was mm -hmm. something that would, you know, even if I didn't end up doing that in the long term, I knew it was something that, you know what, this is going to be really useful for me yeah. um, in the long term. And, and yeah, so I've been kind of doing that now for, seven or eight years and it's yeah I really enjoy it it's given me some really good skills some really good experiences so 
Um, and I think, it, yeah, it, it stands me in pretty good stead for what I'm doing now in terms of uh, other projects as well. Can you just give like a description of the of the role? Because it's the kind of role that you see a lot <laughs> of being advertised for places of like we want someone on a project or a project manager for this. And I know it can vary from sector to sector, but just can you give us sort of a sketch of what a project manager is doing and what sort of skills you need to utilize? Yeah, definitely. So it's one of those strange jobs where you don't really need like a detailed knowledge of of one particular of the the projects that you're managing so for example mine is uh, technology so I, I work with a lot of people who have good knowledge of electrical engineering so I kind of spend a lot of my time probably one of the biggest things about project management is communication so it's about making sure and someone told me in fact that project management is not about doing the work it's about making sure the work gets done so it's, yeah. it's about making sure the right people are talking to each other when you know, there's loads of different threads within a, pro a project yeah. to uh, to kind of make sure, you know, when this person has done their bit, you need to make sure that this person is aware. And, and you know, a lot of the time people get very focused on what they're doing that sometimes it needs someone to kind of be a little bit away from the detail and yeah. just have that overarching view of, OK, this is going on over here. If this takes longer, then I know that's going to impact on, on this person over here. So... It's um, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds really cliche, but no two days are the same. It's yeah. there's always different things going on. There's always different challenges, and um, you know, certainly with the industry that I'm in, every every project will be different from the last one. For you know, it might be it's a new country. I've never you know um, yeah. kind of done a project in that country before, or um, it might be using a new technology. So it's yeah. There's there's lots of different aspects with project management and it's i think probably the biggest thing you need to be able to do is to to communicate and be comfortable in in going to people and and you know asking a bit about what they're doing you know if, if you don't fully yeah. understand it like oh what what is that what does that do and you know it's i think that's because that's in my nature to be just a little bit nosy and a bit inquisitive it, it kind of yeah. works well for me to to do that role cool and i'm guessing that you don't have just one big project that you do for x amount of weeks or months and then another project i i imagine it more is like you might have a big one that's running over a period of months and then some other little ones and some things come in and out and some end and then some repeat and is it more like that or is it more sort of you just do a thing and then do another thing uh it it depends it's that's a super vague answer i know but it, it yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in in the pay TV industry, it takes uh, quite a long time for somebody. You know, so if you imagine you, the starting point for me would be somebody saying, "I want a set top box that does X, Y, and Z," or "I want a product that does X, Y, and Z." So yeah. it's from the point of them first saying it and documenting that what they want, all the way through to when they physically arrive wherever yeah. they need to be uh, in the you know in a user's home. So. Uh, it it's one of those things where if it's a new technology or if it's you know if there's a lot of kind of extravagant things in there then it might be 12 or, or 18 months uh, until yeah. that project is finished but if it's the case where actually we know that there's something like that already so we just kind of want to change it a little bit um mm -hmm. then yeah it might be it might be four to six months or so so um but yeah i mean in terms of project management generally there's there's a whole variety of the project could be anything from a week or a couple of weeks to yeah. to months or years you know when you th look at these kind of government projects like the you know hs2 and things like that that's not a project i would like to manage i don't think yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah massive and going on for years and huge huge budgets and loads of moving parts and loads of different suppliers absolutely so getting to know the job quite well uh, what are the kind of pluses and minuses of of being in this in this field? I'd like uh, I would I would assume that as you say, you know, every day is different. That variety is like one of the perks. That it's not always the same thing every day. So, sort of what are mm. the what are the good and bad things are there? Yeah, I mean, in terms of starting with the the good stuff, I mean, I've I've been really fortunate because some of the places that I've been involved in projects for places like Malaysia. Our, a lot of my colleagues are based in China, uh, India, and you know, so there's there's lots of different places that I would have never 
there's no chance I would have ever been to um, and got to experience in the way that I have done. Um, so yeah, for me, being able to do that and and being paid to do that is just yeah something I couldn't even comprehend before I started doing what I do. So um, yeah, it, it's something over time you kind of take a little bit for granted. But um, yeah, I've seen some some amazing things through the time that I've been there. So yeah, definitely that's a, a big plus for me. Um, I think the downside is probably linked to that in that it means that I do have to spend a lot of time away from the family. So um, I have a daughter who's now. 12 years old um, and a wife so yeah being away from the family can be a little bit tough sometimes. So obviously that brings us back to Covid because obviously you're going to be locked down most of this year so the, the travel's off but I mean has that affected work things? I would I would imagine with some of your travel that some things will be essential because there's fabrication involved so you need to see the moving parts and you need that tactile experience with the products and so in an industry like yours I would imagine a lot of the jobs that they can be done from home but all the fabrication and manufacturing they'll they'll have to go in or they'll have to be closed down is that the case it's been i mean that yeah as you say the the travel has been kind of has disappeared completely for me since i think the last time i was away was probably december last year so uh yeah it's been a long time since i traveled which is unusual for me so um yeah that did take some adjustment in the uh in the beginning but yeah i mean i think because a, a lot of the people that I work with, you know, the various uh, customers and projects that I've been, I've been working on in that time, other countries have all been in the same situation. So it, it, everyone kind of has been, you know, what there's just we're just going to stop the travel. And in the you know in the early stages, it was we'll stop as a precaution and we'll see how it goes. But obviously, yeah. then we got to the point where it was like, no, no, we're we're not allowing travel between countries now. So. I'll be interested to see how that plays out from here um, yeah. and, and to see, you know, uh, what and not just international travel, but also, you know, people's situation with how they're working at the moment. It's all from home. And, you know, yeah. to see how that progresses to will people go back into the office or will this be kind of a turning point And, you know, we'll see people working from home more. I think we've I've seen a lot of companies kind of say that's the way that they're going to go or at least look at things like hot desking and things like that so um but yeah in, in terms of my situation with travel it's made things really challenging actually for communication as I say the big part of my job is the communication so yeah. whereas you know when you go somewhere and you'll be face to face with somebody um you'll there'll be little things that you'll pick up on that you just might not when you're having a, a video conference or you're having a conversation over the phone yeah. so there'll be you know and it, and it might be even at the end of the day when you're traveling you, you might go out for a pint with somebody and then there'll just be something in a conversation you go oh that's interesting actually um and you know it'll be something you'll follow up on the next day whereas the conversations as they are now are very kind of succinct and to the point and they kind of cover what you need to cover when you're ringing them you know so you ring someone you're having an idea in your mind this is what I want to talk to them about okay I've talked to them about that now and obviously you'll see how they're doing and everything but you know more often than not you kind of don't get that extra stuff that you would yeah. do from face-to-face -face conversation it's kind of like you're getting an increase in efficiency to a degree in sense of doing the thing that you want to do and being able to do it faster but you're losing out on the possibility of spontaneity and, and opportunities arising from from things that occur to you in the moment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I guess it's one of those things we'll never know how much of an impact that's had. We can never go back and look at, you know, oh, if things would have gone differently, actually, we might have done this a little bit better or this differently. But yeah, so it, it would have been interesting if we interesting if we'd have been able to find a way to do that. But, but no, and as I say, I think it will be a turning point for a lot of industries as well um yeah you know, in terms of how they operate and and how people operate in their working environments which will be as i say very interesting to see i agree i think because there's you know there's a lot of other fundamental things under you know the way that society will react to this and the way that we have reacted to it that doesn't exist in a vacuum there were already conditions that existed before we reacted it to it in the way that we reacted and that reaction so the talk about the death of the the inner city you know the city center sort of thing with the shopping and retail there and that's been kind of a long-term trend but it's something that's been accelerated by covid 
Mm. So people are going into town less and shopping from home more, which they were doing anyway, but they're doing it a lot more now. Yeah. So I think, but then if we're all going to go more local, if everything has to be more local anyway because of climate change, then you need more of those shops in the local area, you know, because I think people, you're not going to get rid of place, you know, like a cafe on the corner, like a nice area will have somewhere that you can go outside your house and go and sort of sit and it's got a space, whether it's a public or private space, but there will be those spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's what pe people like to have. And they're the sort of things that I think build community, you know, having those little businesses and restaurants. You look at little areas, all the best areas have their own little kind of, you know, restaurants and bars and stuff. There's something going on there. So I think you'll see that my personal opinion is I think you'll see that happening a lot more in all of the areas. You'll see kind of the return of the local pub rather than trendy bars in town. That's my yeah. feeling anyway. I don't know. But... Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right as well. We've seen that over time. And it, certainly having lived in Leeds my whole life, I've seen Leeds evolve a lot. Um, and, you know, we, I, I know we've seen things like Trinity that have been put up, which are kind of full of, you know, multinational kind of brands. But also, I, I remember very kind of distinctly years ago thinking, when you go into Leeds, all you see is McDonald's or all you see is Burger King. And you, and you see there's nothing that's got any character in there anymore. Yeah. Whereas now it, it's kind of, it's almost like we've gone back to, as you say, having like smaller independent traders but that's been done on a bit of a larger scale so in things like trinity and leeds you've got like the the kitchen which is made up of lots of smaller traders yeah. but actually it's part of a big you know it's part of a big uh, kind of environment there where it's i don't know it's kind of those two things have merged a little bit um but no i think you're absolutely right and as i say certainly where i live in leeds there's a very much a kind of um it, it's always been because it's a market town it's always been one of those places where you'll have that little cafe on the corner and stuff like yeah. that so i'd be interested in you know even here to see how that changes if it does change anything because i've what I've is actually because we've got a lot of those places already we've seen those um small independent places actually react really quickly to yeah. the whole you know having to deal with no people coming through the door so you know a lot yeah. of them have kind of teamed up with other smaller businesses and and kind of pulled their resources and said you know what how can we together manage like local deliveries to people you know you sell fruit and vegetables you sell uh you know bespoke i don't know whatever it is liquors or yeah. you know different things how can we pull our resources to say you know what this person's probably going to need all of us for something yeah. actually let's get one person in the car that gathers everything and then takes it to this this person so yeah. i've seen an interesting response that way so yeah i think the the outcome is going to be a little bit different everywhere but um it'll be as i say very interesting yeah well i think the reaction will be based on people's capability to react and you know ways that they think of to react so i think you know certain sectors and certain industries and certain businesses will do really well out of it as as with anything and then other ones will have a really hard time with it but i think at the moment everyone's because it's such a sudden change you know it's like you know just uh, knocked everyone for six kind of thing and then it's like okay well what do we do now how do we adjust to this and i think we're all coming out of that phase of like oh well it'll all be over by christmas and we're a bit more like well this is this is here now so <laughs> we have to work around it now yeah yeah well you know what i i remember in it must have been about march time and and it was a friend of mine we'd planned to go up to glasgow for a weekend in april uh, and i remember in march someone saying i think we're gonna have to postpone this trip a little bit and we we're kind of like no it's fine it'll blow over don't worry about it there's no way we're going to be in lockdown for that long and then yeah, yeah. here we are in in november and yeah yeah, and we're, there's still, I mean, we postponed it 12 months, so it's, it's. I mean, and even then, it might be longer than that before we end up doing this for, you know, it was for a 40th birthday, it might be 42 or 43 by the time we get to go. So uh, we've, we've, we've briefly touched on COVID, so I suppose the other big, the other big work affecting thing in the room at the moment is Brexit in terms of your work. Are you aware of any effects that it will have or might have 
because obviously there's again there's a lot of stuff we don't know with it mm. but there are working within any industry there are certain things that you you know are, are potential things that could affect you so from that perspective are there is there anything that's I don't want to say concerning but are there any major kind of like things that your your company and your your role will have to deal with from what we know of Brexit so far yeah it's it's a funny one I mean a, a lot of the I mean for the industry I think there'll be some there'll be some impact. I, I think in terms of what I do, I mean, a lot of the work I do is for, uh, certainly now is for customers and operators that are based in Europe. So um, a lot of the work I do is already in Europe. So I think for me personally, probably any kind of travel restrictions that might come in. And I, I, in fact, I just saw today that um, there was, I think the announcement is it free movement has just officially kind of the bill has passed. So um, I think that will affect me in terms of travel. So, you know, if there's any visas or stuff like that that need to be done. But, I mean, I, I guess that's going to be relatively neg negligible. I imagine it's probably a case of, you know, once you've done your paperwork, then you're allowed to go for, X, you know, X period of time. So, yeah, probably in terms of the effect on on me, I'm not sure there'd be too much um, of an impact. I mean, it's it's... A, a relatively safe industry in terms of its its entertainment you know we're providing mm, yeah. um you know services for tv and and uh, i mean there's probably other dangers that we would worry and it's about home, it's more. home entertainment as well so it's not like people have to go out to be entertained it's that you're giving yeah. it to them in their homes which they're going to be in so that's yes. fairly safe exactly yeah and uh, i mean it's one of the we've been quite fortunate actually in the over this period of the last kind of 10 11 12 months or so because everybody's been at home actually it's boosted our industry by the fact that more people are watching tv more people are you know needing uh, these devices to be able to consume content so um yeah for us it's it's been an interesting time because well but you know i see a look on things like linkedin and, and everybody you know recruitment for example has just been decimated and and you know there's been certain industries that are just upside down um and travel obviously um but yeah for us it's been relatively okay touch touch wood so um yeah, yeah. but yeah i think in terms of brexit i'm not sure we will see a massive impact in terms of how we operate i think we we see bigger changes in kind of the shifts in technology really so um probably you know when th people are using different devices it, it's about then how how do we adapt to that and make sure that we're we're still able to provide you know what consumers will need to to be able to watch their content however they choose to watch it i did a media degree and you work in sort of building the, basically the the apparatus that people consume their media on like a few years back there was this big conversation which you probably heard within your industry of like oh well everyone's going to go towards this black box where it will be your computer your mobile phone you know like do you remember this at all of like there would, there would just be one device in the home yes yeah yeah every, i remember yeah and it was just like and loads of people were really like yes it would just be one device in the home and it's like no because you want different devices to do different things and you're not always just in your home yeah so um yeah any other kind of weird things that you've seen through the course of your career in terms of people talking about this is going to be the future of this business and then it just never happens um i'm not i mean i'm trying to think back if anyone made any like really bold predictions you know that just kind of fell and, and didn't happen um I would say from the 90s, the paperless office was the biggest load of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, paperless office. No, you just fill in more forms and they're all digital now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I can't think of anything. Nothing springs to mind, really. That was kind of really big, bold predictions. I think probably the big one for me that, that certainly in within TV that I thought it was really, really going to take off and it never took off as much as I thought it was going to do. And then weirdly, there was a, a change was like 3D TV. I, I thought 3D yeah. TV, you know, that, that could have been like, you know, to immerse yourself in, mm. in, you know, if they could find a way to do that. I thought that, you know, that's absolutely a game changer. 
and then and I remember when HD came along, um, and there's me thinking, oh well, it's it, okay, it's a little bit better, but it's never gonna. I don't see that catching on. And that was a time when I was working at Sky actually, and I remember them, you know, they gave us all this kind of like all these materials to talk to customers about and stuff like that. And I was like, ah, it's, yeah, it's nothing. This it's never gonna last. But yeah, then obviously now we we've seen that, and then the next generation from that um, in 4K. But yeah, 3D kind of just fell by the wayside and and hd dvds remember hd dvds when they yeah, yeah. came around for about six months <laughs> <laughs> so as well as working you're also working to set something up as well outside of this role is that right that's right yeah, yeah. right so if we talk about that for a little bit so what what is this that you're trying to set up so it's basically a, a way of kind of create, creating small communities of people that share stuff that they don't really use. So if you think of the things you have lying around your house that you, you know, you'll you buy and you'll use a couple of times and then it'll just sit in the garage or sit in the loft for, for the rest of time. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of items that we have in our home that are like that. So... Um, and there are a lot of people that then might want to use similar items and, and maybe they they either can't afford or don't particularly want to go out and buy whatever it is. Um, so, you know, I think recently I, I had to, um, we, we have two cats and I, I needed to cut a cat flap in my door. I, um, I've got one of those UPVC doors um, and I thought I don't really have any, I mean, I've got a saw but that's not going to do much. I've got a hammer and, you know, I could have it with a hammer and chisel or something, but I thought, you know what, I probably need something a bit more productive. So, I'd, um, yeah, I'd, I found myself looking for a, a jigsaw. Um, I, I knew I didn't have one. I knew I was probably not going to have that much use for it, but, you know, I needed it for that specific job. So I think there's a lot of things like that where, you, you know, you might go to a friend or you might go to somebody you know. So I, I guess what I'm trying to do is to widen out that community of, who people know and who, you know, who they know has things, um, basically to, uh, I mean, to stop people buying unnecessarily when they really only need things once or twice. Um, uh, and then, yeah, to, to allow people who have gone out and bought them, you know, the chance to keep it because some people like to have stuff. Um, but also, they, you know, they can get a little bit of value out of it by, by saying, you know what, you can borrow this for a few days and, uh, um, yeah, give me a bit of cash for for my troubles and a little bit of beer money or whatever. And um, yeah, so it's I'm just trying to build a, a bit of a community around that, really. Yeah, I and I I think there's a lot of value in that because uh, obviously you're making stuff that's already existing that's not doing anything available to people to use, rather than you know as you say people buying more stuff. But it's also you know that opens it up to people who you know whether you don't want to buy it or you can't afford to buy it but you do need the thing it's giving that accessibility um so how long how far into it are you at the moment then uh, so i mean it's something that i've been toying with for a long time but but i've just kind of been reluctant to execute because I've, I've been at the stage where once i i show people that there's a way they can do it then I probably have very little influence on how that's shaped over time then and, and kind of yeah. lose the, the ability to kind of go, no, this is what I wanted it to be. But actually, it might not, I've kind of realised that might not be a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm at the point now where kind of in, in within the Otley area, I'm kind of probably a few weeks away from kind of doing a small launch um, on, yeah, just allowing, you know, a small small number of people to register on there, put their items up and just be able to then communicate with each other. So the idea is to start it out on that small scale, see the kind of things that people are interested in, see the kind of things that people have got that they want to share, see the kind of things that people are looking for. Uh, I have some ideas of what I think might work. And, I've, you know, in various bits of research, I've seen, what works in similar platforms. Um, so yeah, it, I just thought the best idea is put it out there, let people have a go and, and see see what comes out of it. And then, yeah, just, I guess, try and, and trim it around the edges and get that into a model where we think, you know what, actually we're happy that these are the things that people are interested in and then, and then try and grow that out to um, more areas initially around Leeds and then 
hopefully um, take that to other areas around the country. Have you got a name for it yet? Uh, we do. It's WIN. So that's W-Y-N. And it stands right. for, very cleverly, what you need, when you need. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you got some marketing people involved as well? Or are you just... Yes, I've I've been doing a lot of research into the sharing economy. So the sh- and I don't know if you've come across the term before, but the sharing economy is essentially the the terminology that's used for other sites that do that kind of person to person interaction for stuff. So um, I mean, even the big sites like Uber, Airbnb, they're considered to be um, sharing economy platforms. And Olio, I don't know if you've heard of Olio, they're kind of they reduce do a lot to reduce food waste, so they, I think they yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they do work with supermarkets to you know try and distribute food that's not going to get used to people. Yeah, who might need they it. reduce to clear stuff as well, and they'll, they'll notify people in the local area that, that oh this stuff's there and it's cheap and yeah. As I say, the first thing I want to do is kind of just prove the the idea first of all and say you know is this something that people are willing to do? you know because it's you know I think about there's some things I have where I think you know what I'd be happy enough to allow someone to use that for a period of time um, but then I mean as I mentioned I'm also musicians so I've got various bits of music equipment and I think I'd be a little bit reluctant to give yeah. that to somebody else unless there was some way that I could make sure you know there's always a thing of, okay, you know, what's the kind of level? And this is the the argument I'm having with myself at the moment as to yeah. what's the kind of level that people would be happy to allow someone else to use something up to. So, you know, I, I kind of look around at the things I've got and think, yeah, DVDs, I'd be happy for someone to use those. If it's not a big loss, if they don't come back or if they get damaged. Um, but then, you know, there's other things like guitars and and amplifiers that I think I'd, I'd need to know that there's some something in place there that if if anything happens to that then I need to I need to be sure that that's going to get resolved so I think this is the idea of of what I want to do with the trial just trying to understand what that what's that threshold for people you'll probably get a lot of things like you say like dvds and stuff that people are kind of willing to lend out or tools and then some musical instruments, but not other musical instruments. Yeah. So would you ever potentially, if you if you were getting a lot of demand on the site, I mean, these are all hypothetical. So yeah. if, if you were getting a lot of demand for a particular thing, say, let's use the example of a jigsaw, and you've got only three people who will lend out jigsaws, would you potentially... would you potentially have a library of things, you know, if they were in a particular area of, like, Everybody needs a, a, a step ladder. Like everyone's always asking for step ladders, yeah. <laughs> and they're awkward to kind of transfer between people. Maybe it'd be useful if we had a bunch of step ladders. I don't know. It's just as a. I thought I, I have thought about that as as a way of kind of getting things moving. Because if I mean, I guess I might be in a position where I go to the big wide world and go, "Hey guys, I've got this uh, this great new platform. Everyone go and have a look." And then I'm sat there. And there's a tumbleweed moment like weeks later where where actually nobody's willing to lend their stuff. But, you know, there might be people who want stuff. Um, so actually, the, there's no value there because the, the kind of the, uh, you know, I've not met the supply side with the yeah, demand yeah. side to make sure, yeah, yeah. you know, those people are connected. So I think what I also want to try and do is just ask the questions and and say to people what, you know, what what would you need for a short period of time are you doing work on your house are you doing you know yeah. some diy where it would be useful to have something and even if i don't have it i think that'd be really valuable to to understand and then as you suggest and i'm kind of keeping my eye out now for on things like the the selling sites for people selling stuff i think might work that it will be yeah. not a big overhead if i myself even just went out and, and said you know what i'll pick up five or six bits um and i'll put them on there as a user um and see if there, if anybody kind of has any interest in borrowing them. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that'll be, it, it's a relatively affordable experiment for me to do. And then if it doesn't work, then I can always repurpose or, or pass those on to people who do need them, you know, for different projects. There are a lot of uh, um, people that I know in various places in Leeds that are doing different projects that are, that are not exactly the same, but they, they they put a lot of emphasis on trying to reuse things and repurpose things yeah, where yeah. possible. So, yeah, I think it's it'd be 
something I'd, and it's something I've discussed with I do have some ongoing conversations with like the town council in Otley as well about about a library of things they've been keen on doing this for a long time so actually it kind of fell at the right time to have a conversation with them about doing something like that and and we could probably work on something that was complimentary because you know for my short-term needs Otley will be the place but that's something I'd like to grow outside of that and and then I always try and and you know what it might turn out over time that the best way to do this is by having you know various kind of tool libraries or libraries of things um in in different places um and that might be the way that it seems to work best but yeah I guess or, I guess we'll see or it could potentially be I mean you you know like the whole story of slack was just created as like a it was for some people working on a particular computer game or something like that and they were like we need a quick way to chat between us and then they invented this platform and then they kind of sold that off and then it's become this huge you know multi-billion dollar industry everyone's wow. like slack great um so i mean there's you know other potential applications for it and stuff so you know where where people are setting up other tool libraries are potentially you you might be the person who invents the way that fixes how people get stuff from other people potentially yeah well, that's it i mean i guess it's 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 not just about the things themselves yeah you're right it's about that creating that interaction between people and that you know that community that's actually the valuable thing and, and getting people to 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 talk and to to share idea i mean even if it turns out i know there's um i've been speaking to someone who's working on a a, a another type of sharing economy platform but it's based on skills so it's more about if you have something that you know that you can do and you can do well yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can do, you know you can basically say here is an hour of my time to do a task in exchange for an hour of somebody else's time to do another task so yeah um you know it's a case of I don't know how to hang a door, but I do know how to run a project. You know, yeah. is it valuable, and, and can I find someone where it's valuable to exchange that, or, yeah. or even build up? You know, spend a bit of time working on projects for a few different people, and build up a little bit of, of credit if you like, and then use that for a, maybe a bigger project that someone can do in exchange. So it's, um, yeah, it's there where like the labour is the currency, um, okay. which is a, yeah, it's a really interesting project I've seen. So how did you kind of, did you have this idea before coming into the kind of, did you fall into finding out about the sharing economy as you had this idea or was this already something that you were aware of and you kind of went, what if I did this and then sort of through further research came into other stuff or? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's weird. I never, there was never kind of like that, that light bulb moment or anything for me where I kind of thought oh this is what I want to do and, and this was the thing that triggered it it was I think it was just over time I've been involved you know in in other smaller projects around reducing waste and you know and trying to so one of the things that I did was um, I don't know if you've heard of refill so it, it basically encourages people yep. to take uh, you know take a water bottle with you when you go somewhere and then you can on a map you can find places that will happily top up your bottle for you even if it's a bar or whatever, you know, they're not going to begrudge you for going in just to ask for some water or anything because there's always that awkwardness of like, oh, I just want to drink a water. I don't want to buy a beer. But um, so, yeah, so I did a little bit with them. So I've always kind of been in, interested in those kind of projects and been involved in that. And, you know, certainly at home as well, we do a lot to try and reduce our own waste where we can. So from that perspective, I've always been interested just in, different ideas to do that and then yeah this just have kind of seemed like a natural progression from that then to how okay this is what I'm doing how can I encourage other people to to do you know to be conscious about their own things um yeah. you know and, and instead of the kind of immediate thing being oh, I'll just go on Amazon and I'll see if I can buy a cheap jigsaw you know for the first thing to to be can I find someone who's got one of these that I could borrow yeah. because I know I'm not going to need it all the time. So it's, yeah, for me, it's just trying to, if possible, just help to change that mentality a little bit of, of, I don't need to own this, but I do need to use it, you know? So think of more, I need to use it and how can I use it rather than I need yeah. to go and buy it. I think that's something that's very much being cultivated though. Um, 
you know, because I can remember growing up in the 80s and I, I'm like, I'm pretty certain at this point that it was me and my sister that have got my mum and my dad to start throwing everything away. <laughs> you know, like, to, to just be like, no, throw it away, throw that away, you know, because we're watching all the adverts on, on TV and we want all the toys and we want new things and we Clear the space, get yeah. rid of all the old rubbish stuff. <laughs> Nice. Throw everything away. You don't need it. Don't keep it. Stop. Why have you got all these weird habits where you save things and reduce waste? Put everything in the bin, and then we turn around later and go, "Why are you throwing stuff away all the time? You don't keep it." <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they used to be much better, but yeah, like uh, I really think we've been, you know, we've been kind of trained into a culture of of disposability of throwing everything away of you know buy a new stuff get a refill throw it away throw it away yeah um, so it will take some time to break those habits i mean we've just become used to them but i i think it'll change i think we've seen we've already seen though a massive shift in you know i guess you look at the one generation to the next and you see the difference so you look at and i did a little kind of bit of a write up on this and it's where my two I guess my two passions cross so it's the TV pay TV side with this you know this kind of sustainability side it's that for me Netflix played a massive part in changing like the perception you know because I don't know if you're the same as me and uh, certainly my parents but with massive DVD collections Mm -hmm. so you, you know you just have like loads and loads of DVDs it's like I don't, I bet I'll get it and I'll watch the DVD when I buy it and then it'll go on the shelf and I'll probably not watch it for six or seven years. I used to and buy then, them and not watch them. <laughs> yeah, that's it, still in the cell phone. And I, I even remember had, um, when I first met my wife, obviously girlfriend at the time, I had uh, uh, the film Dodgeball. Have you seen the film Dodgeball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was. Or you can dodge a wrench. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So that was one of my favourite films at the time. And I had, I literally had two copies of it. I had one at my mum and dad's and I had one at my girlfriend's house because I'd watch it that much. And I didn't want to take, you know, and that's how, (laughs) like you say, that's how disposable things were and and still continue to be to some extent. So I think, you know, when Netflix came along and they they kind of changed that, I mean, they were around before. They were renting DVDs out to people before what they're doing now and, before they were the blockbuster killer and they came along with their kind of streaming service. And I think that changed massively the, the perception of people and it came at the right time for the generation of, of kind of kids at that time. And it was like that mentality of, I, I want to be able to watch this. I don't necessarily need to own a DVD. I want to see this and I want to see it quickly. Mm. Um, and I think that has happened and, and that's kind of then grown out in a lot of the i mean youtube again same same kind of thing it's i mean in some ways youtube is a sharing economy platform because it's Mm. it they don't own the content you as a person create content and other people consume it so all they're doing is providing the vehicle to to do it um so yeah i think you see all these kind of um companies and spotify again cd collections you know and, and record collections they'll be the purists of course that that keep um you know the physical copies of stuff because there's kind of nostalgia and stuff like that but certainly in the kind of younger generation i i don't think my daughter will be seen dead with a cd when she's uh, when she's a bit older it's going to be it, it's purely digital and and purely um through streaming yeah. now so i think that that mentality of access over ownership which is the fundamental thing of like the sharing economy that's like the, yeah, yeah. the strap line if you like um is becoming um yeah the the way forward and i think platforms like these and and certainly i'm obviously i'm in the the echo chamber of these kind of platforms so i'm seeing a lot of them but there are a lot of people doing a lot of really interesting things with you know and just kind of things you wouldn't even think about there was um a guy who in bristol i say a guy there was he was the main founder, but there's a, he's got some significant backing now, but CarShare, um, so it's a company, I think, in Bristol. Um, and they basically, for the t- periods of time when your car's not being used, it's the same kind of thing. It's like, well, someone else can use it um, while I'm not using it. So I think they started at an airport. So it was like, you know, when you go on holiday and you leave your car for two yeah, weeks. Yeah. Basically, the guy said, well, that car's sat there for two weeks. Why not see if we can 
let someone use that for those two weeks and that person who's on holiday, you know, you might have paid towards your day or to you know, she'd be money while you were away. So I think that's how he started because there's no way you're going to use that when it's there. So it's kind of increases the amount of, of use that thing gets but um, yeah. and also provide value for somebody else. So there's there's just loads of different ideas that people have and, and some will work really well and some won't, but that will kind of give ideas then to to the next step and i think yeah i think we're going to see a massive um going back to what you were saying about like the independence and 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 stuff like that kind of having their rise again people i think value that personal touch a little bit people value that yeah. connection with other people so yeah. you know being able to provide a platform that which does that it fundamentally connects one person to another person for something is um yeah i think we're going to see a massive amount of these uh in the future and i i yeah genuinely believe that it's this is kind of the next step of um i don't want to say like the a revolution or anything but it's <laughs> you know it's, it, i think this is just like the next phase of of how how we will interact with companies and people you know we see like going back years they, there was a lot of trust in organizations and, and big stable businesses because you know you knew they were secure you'd happily give you them their money because they provide you with a good service but I think now people I mean from have lost trust in in big organizations to some degree and and in government and things like that so actually they're going back to that fundamental kind of connection between people yeah but I, I, and I I would say that some of that you know some of the social breakdown in trust obviously there's a lot of reasons for it but I think a large part of it is that people feel a lot further away from the people in power whether it's you know your local giant international superstar and you're just going back to return something and you have to fill in all sorts of forms and it gets all Kafkaesque or you bring up the call center and you get sent around all different houses just to make a complaint about buying something Mm. or it's the government and you know you try and ask them simple and then you have to go and do, you know, <clears throat> jump through loads of hoops and people are, are, are longing for a kind of can I just have someone that I can ask a question to and if they give me the wrong answer I can make them accountable for that and if they give me some like really good help I can say thank you very much for that would that is that too much to ask for now yeah I've, I've, do you use uh, I don't know <clears throat> if you use many of kind of Google's products or you've ever had to contact Google but that is the, probably the worst. I mean, in fairness, G Google, I, I really do like Google products. I, I think they provide some fantastic products. Mostly everything but, runs, yeah. <laughs> but when it doesn't work and there's yeah. something that's genuinely wrong, which in fairness, it's rare, but when something doesn't work, to try and get hold of them as a as a user of like Gmail or something like that, it's just an absolute nightmare. You just kind of like, I'd like to speak, and I, I was saying before, I'm a, my job is is as a communicator i like to communicate with people so for me it's easier to have a conversation with someone on the phone and i know some people don't like that my wife would much prefer to send an email to someone and wait a few days for it to come back and that's you yeah. know just different different types of individual but um yeah it's just a nightmare to get hold of them um for yeah it's just like uh, what's going on it's and and you're right i think people do have that frustration there that you know if if it's a big company there's no way i'm going to get to speak to some they're not going to value my me as an individual um which i think yeah it's created that kind of bigger divide between people and these bigger companies but in fairness there are some that do it quite well i mean i've i use uh amazon i try to use it as little as possible but i do use it for some stuff but you know things that they really get right are like the returns when you have to return something yeah. I find that absolutely seamless and I, I don't speak to any, you know, I never really need to contact them for anything, but yeah, they're quite seamless. Well, that's it. It's, it's sort of like Netflix as well. I can imagine that if you ever have to sort of contact Netflix and speak to them, it's probably quite difficult. But yeah, the, the thing is, if you make sure that everything works and that it's simple and it's straightforward and people don't ever have to speak to you, it's just like sign up, pay, <laughs> you get the service and we don't ever have to speak to you. We just have to make sure it runs all the time. Yeah. It's like someone else was saying in terms of, you know, with the plumbing, it's like, um, you know, you're never ringing up your plumber or Yorkshire Water to go, do you know what? I'm really impressed that there's water coming out of these taps. It's clean, <laughs> it's cold, it's clear, this is great. 
Uh, well, that was a bit of a tangent, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but it was an important tangent. It was definitely an yeah. important tangent. One other thing that I was going to say with regard to your project, I was going to ask, in terms of the mutual aid stuff, I don't know if you looked at any of that in how they set up their operations. I suppose it's a different kind of thing, but I know, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know the details of the story, but I heard when there was that big volunteer army at the start of the lockdown of people wanting to help out, and they had mm. huge issues of actually organizing it and sort of being able to allocate things and kind of like actually execute that resource and from what I've seen it seems to be sort of local mutual aid things kind of set up and organize themselves quite well have you looked at any of them and how they organize their things and the flip side of that is because I'm thinking that potentially what you're creating could be something that's very useful in that kind of environment of like because you're you're trying to match demand to supply and needs to needs to supply i suppose yeah yeah no it's not something i have looked at actually what i have been looking at are other other kind of platforms that are doing something kind of vaguely similar so one that i've been looking at with a lot of interest is olio because as you were saying before a lot of the platforms are kind of created out of silicon valley or, or certainly you know the people who create them like to think that and they have this idea in their mind of what will work but then they're kind of so far removed from the actual community that it, it doesn't work. And there was a massive example in the US actually of a company that did, they did exactly that and they got millions and millions of, of dollars in funding and then it just died. It was just, it just didn't work. And I think that was a prime example of, they were just so far removed from what they were trying, what problem they were trying to solve. Yeah. It just didn't work. But um, no, Olio, I think have done a really good job of building the communities actually they've got a lot of their workforce if you like and the people that are doing the distributing are all volunteers so it's you know they've got a really good network of people that are, that are working with them you know in order to kind of support this cause but no the, so the mutual aid thing is not something I've uh, I've looked at but it might be something that's worthwhile looking at obviously it's a different kind of set of things that they're trying to do but it is about accessibility and making connections and I think that the term engagement you know like the way that sort of digital marketers and so on they will always talk about engagement and the moment mm. engagement is anything from like looking at it clicking on it to actually making a purchase I think that's going to get extended because I think what they'll do is you know clicks will drop right down and they'll just be for marketers and then you'll be looking at like what can we actually get people to do you know how far along a path can we take them so in in your example maybe so you want some people to have the app download the app, take part in it, either to get something or to lend something. Mm. And then from there, more community things happening. You know, you don't just want a click and a like and a download, but you want an actual interaction at the end as well. It's not just a purchase that, that someone's making. You're yeah, that's it. to create activity. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that's one of the things that I need to put a lot of time in trying to understand the, I guess, the behaviours around how people are, interacting with it so i know certainly one of the things that's in my mind if someone opens the app and they search for something and it's not there then that's not something that i want to sit there and ignore because that's something that i i you know i need to be able to take that and say you know what we've had 50 people looking for mountain bikes in this area is there something about that area that means people are really interested in mountain bikes is you know it might be the lake district or something you know and and try and understand you know why are why are people engaging with it? Are people engaging with the app because they have something and they want to put it out there? Because, you know, I guess from that perspective, people might lose interest really quickly. That mm. did, And like you say, you might, and I did it, this is exactly what I did with the Olio app originally. I opened up the app, and um, this was probably more than a year ago. I opened up the app and I had a look at what was around. There was nothing of interest for me. So I left it on my phone for a few days expecting to see some notifications and nothing came and then you know when I next went through doing my sweep of apps that I've not used for ages that mm. went so it was you know it's things like that and I want it to be valuable for people to to do it and when they first go on they get something of value from it even if it's not exactly what they need at that point in time so yeah that, I think that's the bit that I'm very cautious about getting right because it could otherwise just have it could be another one of those where it's like okay yeah we've had thousands of downloads of the app but there's only been 10 people that have actually swapped anything and it's it's you know it, 
it's not it hasn't added the the value that I wanted it to. So yeah, which is why I kind of stripping it right back to its bare essentials of yeah. First of all, what do people want from it? What what do people want to swap? Yeah, it's a hard nut to crack. I think like I can see there in terms of like it's that it's a good idea. It's great. There's lots of potential in it. We just have to nail this thing. But I don't know what that thing is specifically. Yeah, yeah. I have to find what it is, and then when I can find that, and then I've got it. It's, That's it. it. Yeah, There's a, there is a magic formula somewhere. I just need. Yeah. To, and, and you know what? It might be maybe maybe in twelve months or in a, in a few years, you'll be sat with your Spotify licensing deal, and I'll be I'll be just about to launch in Manchester, which if you don't know is just across from Leeds. And uh, you know we'll we'll be looking back and saying, oh yeah, remember when we were talking about that formula? Yeah, it was it was actually quite simple. <laughs> that, that's what I'm hoping. Back, we'll who, who would have known it was something so obvious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you just ask people; it's fine. Just ask them, easy. Well, that's episode eight. You can find further details about John's Win Project. That's W Y N. What you need when you need it. Project in the show notes. I was very happy to get into a discussion about the sharing economy as it's a subject I have a personal interest in and I would love to hear about similar initiatives by other learners. But I don't just want to hear about new ways of working. I want to ask you, what do you do? So whatever your job, if you're a learner, drop me a line and help me get a bit closer to 1,000 interviews. So you can email me at workinghourspod at westernstudios.com. So just your name, your contact details and a bit of a bio and I will be in touch. If you like the show and would like to support us, caring is sharing. Like and subscribe, join our Patreon or donate via the website western-studios.com. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram and Twitter. That's it from me for now. I will be back in two weeks time. Take care. All the best. Thank you.